All right, everyone. Um, sorry again, the first two minutes um, didn't have any audio, so uh, thanks to Patrick who realized that. So I'm um, just commenting this part. Uh, we uh, start seeing orbital parameters or orbital elements. And uh, what I was mentioning here is that um, we stopped uh, last time talking about uh, the state vector, which is uh, the position and velocity of a satellite in Cartesian coordinates. So it's the vector r and vector v, which I'm hopefully going to write pretty soon. Um, so that's xi plus yj plus zk and their time derivatives. Uh, and since we need six quantities to represent position and velocity, uh, if you want to switch to any other types of coordinates, like orbital parameters, we still need six. And uh, so we go from this Cartesian type of coordinates to something else, which is extremely convenient for astrodynamics. And uh, the usual combination uh, starts with reusing the quantities that we have already defined, which is the angular momentum h, its magnitude, and the eccentricity e. There's no reason why we shouldn't be using those, and the true anomaly. So things that allowed us to work in the plane so far are still there. We need to add three more which will give us the orientation of the orbital plane in ECI. And uh, those are usually other angles, a particular sequence of other angles called 313, which allows us to identify how a particular reference frame is oriented with respect to another reference frame. So in other words, how an object B is oriented with respect to an object A. So H, E, and theta are three of the orbital parameters. The other three that uh, we define in the next of the lecture are three angles that allow us to tell us how the plane of the orbit is oriented and uh, how uh, the E vector is oriented. So in other words, my reference frame B is going to be the plane of the orbit with uh, attached coordinate system H, E, and the cross product of the two. It's the perifocal coordinate system. And then uh, the, um, the three order angles are going to tell me how that is oriented with respect to the X, Y, and Z of the ECI. And I think this should cover the first uh, almost three minutes of silence that we had. I'm sorry about that. Um, so we'll stop here and uh, the rest of the video will let me uh, actually talk in. And uh, as I started mentioning last time, these three are defined as a sequence called 313 Euler angle sequence. They are angles. You've seen Euler angles before? You know everything about Euler angles? No? Yes? You don't remember? How many sequences can you define? 12 different types of sequences. What are the singularities of all the angles? Come on, I don't believe you. You must have seen this stuff somewhere. Never. What do you do with all the angles? So you basically represent, so if we're talking about a reference frame that is rotating with respect to another reference frame, you of course need some sort of three coordinates to represent the three-dimensional rotation, right? The orientation of frame B with respect to frame A. That is what we do with all the angles. You choose a sequence of rotations uh, so that you can represent how B is oriented with respect to A. So um, we'll go more in the, in the details of order angles today and uh, next time. But uh, this is what happens in terms of orbital parameters. We start from uh, our ECI fixed coordinate system, where now we know that the x-axis is pointed pointing at the uh, fish constellation, the z-axis is your north, is the north of the planet, uh, the z, so then the y and, uh, and x are the equatorial plane. Of course, this does not rotate with the planet, okay? The center is the center of the planet, but the axes are inertially fixed, or at least they're pretty steady 
for a few years, as we discussed last time. So this is the orbital, uh, I'm sorry, the equatorial plane. Let me just highlight it with some circle. It's gonna be fun to depict this in 3D, but I'll try. I bought my own color chalks. Yes. The Earth is not what I'm using. I'm using an Earth-centered inertial reference frame. Only the center is what I use of the planet and then the south and north axis. Then the planet can spin one way, turn around, go whatever, do whatever it wants. I don't care because the axes are pointing as, at fixed directions in space. One is the north star, uh, the x is the uh, uh, vernal equinox direction, and the y is what completes the right-handed coordinate system. So in general, what you will see, and I need to be careful how I do this so that it makes some sense, you will have a three-dimensional orbit Right, a trajectory that, uh, whoa, okay, I know, that may not be, of course, in the equatorial plane. So the continuous part of the orbit is what I see on the north side, Z positive, and the dotted line here is what goes below the equatorial plane. And that could be an ellipse or a parabola or a hyperbolic orbit, I don't care. This is a generic trajectory, okay? And I want to do in red as well this, the direction of the perigee. So we sh this is going to give me my direction of the E vector. OK. Can you see the red OK? I have blue, yellow. Yeah, that's huge. I have a smaller blue. I don't need that big. OK, so this will be uh, what we've done so far. We said, OK, this orbit is not changing uh, in time, assuming that we have that simple model for the gravitational force. So this, the plane that contains this orbit doesn't change. And of course, my, so if this is my perigee here, my satellite may just be, so spacecraft, it's somewhere here. Uh, this is our, its position vector, right? R. And this angle here that I don't want to defined yet, I don't want to, I want to change color probably, it's uh, the true anomaly, right? So we've done all sorts of different things in this plane. Now it's time to uh, orient that plane and uh, not clear enough? So do we see what is happening here? S satellite is going, for example, in this direction, on this line, and again the continuous line is what I see north, the rest is below the equatorial plane. Nothing special. And I know that it's not going to change. The mass that is moving on that line continues, the line doesn't change in space. That's the assumption we have. H doesn't change, E doesn't change. Now what is a plane? That plane where the orbit is sitting, it's what? It's the orbital plane, but what can we see? We can see it as something else that we have defined at the beginning. It's a reference frame, right? When we're looking at the orbit from above and we're using the uh, perifocal frame, uh, perifocal coordinate system, we were using the plane as the reference frame. So I want to now introduce those three missing parameters so that I can describe how this plane is oriented with respect to ECI. Okay? And that's what we do with. Uh, with um, with other angles in general. So, in other words, I'm going to define how the uh, E, H, and whatever direction you choose as the cross product uh, basis is oriented with respect to X, Y, Z. Okay? I'm really surprised you haven't seen any of this before, but um, we'll see it. So, the angles that are defined are the following. First of all, we call this point here where your satellite crosses from south to north. That is called the ascending node. Okay. And the three angles that I'm going to use, let me just for fun change color here since I have them. And so the line that connects the origin of your coordinate system with the ascending node is called the node line, of course. You can associate a 
n vector unit vector if you want with that line. And so my first angle that I am going to care about goes from the x-axis to the node line. And it's called, it's usually indicated with the capital omega. Uh, I don't think I really need that board that much, so I'm gonna write it here. So the three angles I'm going to define are these. This is the, called the right ascension of the, it's a long one, ascending node. It is borrowed from what people used to do thousands of years ago, uh, calling about right ascension to locate things in the celestial uh, sphere. So this is the right ascension of what? Of that point of the ascending node. The satellite is going up and uh, it intersects the equatorial plane. Um, at that point, you connect it with the origin and you get the node line. So that's my first order angle. Uh, then my second order angle is, I'm gonna use the same color, is if you put yourself here and you see the node line pointing at you, you go from the direction that goes to north, the z direction, to the h vector, and that is your i. That's inclination of the orbit. Definitely shorter than that one. Oh, by the way, you will find in books uh, that people never use this for the right ascension of the ascending node. They call it ran. So get used to this ran all over the place. It's just the acronym for that. No one wants to write the entire thing, of course. Uh, and uh, my final angle that I really need is the true anomaly. I'm sorry, no. True anomaly, I had it already. That is not an order angle. Well, it's, it's there. It's one of the parameters, so let's leave it there. Uh, but that, that is telling me where the spacecraft is on that track. So it's, it's, that is changing, actually. Uh, while these orbital parameters, they're not going to change, right? For a given orbit, if I give you an orbit, and it's a perfectly Keplerian orbit like we've done so far, the planet is a sphere, uniform mass distribution, r double dot is minus mu over r cubed r, that plane is not going to change. So all these angles that I'm introducing, they don't, they're not supposed to change with time, right? H doesn't change with time, E doesn't change with time. So that orbit doesn't change. In reality, they do, uh, but for now, we don't, we don't care. So what am I missing here? Um, I have this rotation that goes from basically x to the node line. And then if you can imagine the rotation that l moves z to h, it's i. Well, then I don't know how e is oriented. And that is given by, uh, I hope this is visible enough. It should be. This angle that is in the orbital plane little omega, that goes from the node line to the uh, eccentricity direction, or the apse line. Is everything not clear in this sketch? Yes. So in literature, this is just bugging me. So yeah. Um, since we're introducing this, do we yeah. call it the uh, line of nodes? Line of nodes or node line? I think the book calls it, uh, what do you define the line of nodes? That. It's just everywhere you see it, it's called the line of nodes. Well, because there is another node here. That makes sense. Yeah. It's the ascending one and descending one. It's fine. Line of nodes. <laughs> Patrick is happier. Yes. People don't care about the descending one. As long as you have one, the satellite has to go on the other side. So, But that's, yep, that's what we have. So uh, we need to define what that is uh, called. Uh, the little omega is... Uh, the argument of perigee. <laughs> so imagine what is happening here. You can start with your ECI axis. And this is, I'm going to do this in more details when uh, probably next time we start talking about how we go from orbital parameters to the state vector. So today we'll go from state vector to orbital parameters. We need these kind of transformations. Uh, but imagine what is happening here, basically, so that you can, you can tell where the spacecraft is at all times. You start from x, y, and z. You rotate about the z-axis by an angle big omega, and you're moving x to the line of nodes. 
then you rotate about the line of nodes and you bring down z to h and then you rotate about h and you can imagine that the line of nodes goes up to the perigee that is what we do with our angles we represent the orientation of another coordinate system through three single axis successive rotations so we imagine that we get this final configuration which is the orbital plane with e pointing that way and then of course from e you just add the true anomaly and you know where, you know where your spacecraft is uh, but that is the idea of our angles you go from a coordinate system a to a coordinate system b imagining that you've done three successive rotations through individual axes and these are intermediate axes i start from z rotate x goes here then i use the new x if you want rotate i go to h then i use the new the h which is the new z rotate and i get e and those are my three rotations single axis rotations of course I think he was asking me. The order, well, you can get to the same final orientation of an object in space. Still remember that a reference frame and the axis we attach to the reference frame is, is always, you can imagine that as an object, right? So here you can imagine this orbital plane as a disk, right? And you're trying to, to tell me how that disk is oriented in space uh, with respect to ECI. So I can do it with the 313 rotation. Why is this called 313? Because my first rotation, I imagine that it's about the third axis. The second one is about the new x axis, so axis number one, even though it's an intermediate one. And the last one is again about a z, a z type of axis, is where z was before ends up here. So this is the new third axis. So that's why it's called 313. But there are 12 combinations. You can do, you can do a 321 which means I do my first rotation about the z-axis, then the y-axis ends up here in the back, I rotate about the new y-axis. Of course, to represent the same orientation in space, if you switch the sequence, the values of those three angles are different. So if, if this particular configuration is 30 degrees, 20 degrees, 40, and I want to represent the same orbit using a 3 to 1, those numbers are going to be different. And there are 12 combinations that you can think about, uh, but um, each has benefits, you know, pluses and minuses. They, have, they all have singularity issues, as I'll probably describe, uh, I don't know if today or next time. But that is what people do when they talk about orientation of objects in space. Yes? So what are the line of node? The line of node is what I've defined is your satellite if your satellite has a non-zero inclination, by the way, there are some special cases here that we need to discuss, because that line of node doesn't exist if your, if your orbit is equatorial, right? It's the intersection of the orbital plane and the equatorial plane. You can say it that way. Or another way is your satellite crosses south north, north and uh, it's a point. We're going to connect that point with the origin of ECI, and then that's, then that's a line. But that is basically... Uh, what, what it is. So every time from now on someone tells you how to represent, mentions how to represent orientation of an object in space, this thing, my laptop, how it's oriented in space, you can do it in many different ways and one of the most commonly used is other angles because they are angles. You can see them, right? Even if it's a little, you know, annoying to have this rotation and then an intermediate axis here and then this final rotation about the final axis, it's, it's, a little, it's a little bit of an exercise um, to deal with them. They are still angles. I can see them. There are other parameters you can use, quaternions, for example, that people don't usually teach in, in undergraduate classes, but you don't see them. They don't have a physical representation at all. They can still tell you how an object is oriented in space. The bottom line is, if you, if you want to tell me where a point is in space, you tell me x, y, z, right? And that's easy, everybody can understand that. Well, when you're talking about three axes attached to a rigid body, and you need to tell me how they are oriented with respect to another three axes, it's not that simple, right? You need to choose what you want to use. It's easy for a point, you choose three normal axes and you start measuring the projections and that's what you call X, Y, Z. For, for a coordinate system, uh, you need to come up with something a little more complex because it is more complex. It's an actual object oriented with respect to another object. It's not, it's not just a point. So again, there are 12 combinations for orbital parameters, like in this case, that is the one that people use. 
um, again, imagine that you're starting from ECI, rotate Z axis, you go here, rotate about the line of node, uh, you go from Z to H, rotate about H, and that will tell you where uh, the eccentricity is, and then once you have E and H, I, and theta, uh, you know where the satellite is. Basically, you're back in that plane. So, one of the possible combinations for lower angles, uh, I'm sorry, for uh, orbital parameters is exactly this one. Um, these are the three missing ones. Now, they're not usually organized this way, and sometimes you see that uh, H may be replaced by the same major axis. It doesn't matter. Again, this is the norm of H, by the way. Okay, these are not vectors, these are norms. Where you see E is a norm, where you see H is a norm. Um, sometimes you can see this replaced by A, you can see theta replaced by the mean anomaly. So these, you can have A instead, and these you can have M instead. Remember the mean anomaly, the mean anomaly is basically time. There was a question somewhere? Yes. Um, I noticed that you have them in two different orders. Well, the standard, the standard, it's, it's how you memorize them. The way I, I usually think about that is A, E, I, big omega, little omega, theta. It doesn't matter at all. But Replace, it, 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 it doesn't, yeah, that's, that's the one that usually mm. I think you will find, but it, does, it doesn't matter as long as you know what they are. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, what's the point of doing all this? Uh, first of all, we'll get to a point where we start introducing the fact that the planet is not a sphere, and this, these orbital parameters do change, and they, we can find differential equations for those orbital parameters, how they evolve with time, uh, which are really nice, the Gauss variational equations. And, uh, and, and it's, it's just easier to represent an orbit um, this way, believe it or not. So now we need to go from state, what if I give you the state vector, how do you compute the orbital parameters, and vice versa? So the first one is easier. Going back is not that simple, um, but it's absolutely doable. So if I give you R and V, what do you do? So given R and V, what are the orbital elements? I call the orbital parameters orbital elements either way. Yeah, you first, you definitely do what we've done so far, yeah, right? So you, you start from, uh, from known things. So I'm going to say that H is R cross with V. I'm going to say that E is 1 over mu V cross with H minus R over its norm, right? I think there was a mu here. Not mistaken. Anyways, compute the H and E, and, and that's done. We've done it several times. Now, what do you want to do? So, I basically, basically, you start from this. You have this vector and this vector. What do you do with those? So, in other words, if I gave you R and V, you can replace by the fact that I gave you H and E vectors, because with two steps you compute those. Okay, which one do you want to start from? I just have to compute basically angles, right? Um, That's all because basically I already have I already have two of my orbital parameters, right? I have the norm of these and and, and e, so I am missing four of those, just the angles. Find, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Theta. Uh, yeah, you want to start with theta? Okay. Um, how do you do that? No, 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 yeah, it is, there's no, theta is probably the only one that doesn't really, yeah, you can do it right away, I don't think you need, yeah, because you have E and you have R, so, so how do you do it? You, you, if I give you two vectors, this is really all we're going to do, there's nothing else here than doing this. If I have two vectors, A and B, what is the angle between the two vectors? How do you do that? Dot product. If you don't know how that is done, it means that you have not done the homework. Um, so, 
cosine of alpha. So let's actually do it right away for, for, uh, for theta, okay? So can I erase these, H and E? We have them, okay? We have computed those. So cosine, uh, I have it right away here. Cosine of theta will be the arc cosine of E dotted with R over the product of the norms, okay? That is how you compute theta. Now, as I have mentioned at some point when I had MATLAB open, and I'm sorry that my R's sometimes look like V's, I know that. Maybe in the next 10 years I'll be able to do something different. Um, is the audio still moving okay there? Very good. That's strange. Okay, what is the problem with this? We said that theta, we usually like it to be between zero and pi, right? Once you go around, assuming that it's a closed orbit, by the way. If it's a hyperbolic or parabolic orbit, you don't even go past, uh, in the first case, hyperbolic theta infinity, in the second case, pi. But say that it's a closed orbit, so you can actually go around, theta can go around two pi. And um, we just want to cover zero, two pi. So if you want to be positive, zero, two pi, what is the problem with this? Other than MATLAB has the, the issue that if what goes in here is slightly bigger than one, it gives you a complex number. But uh, I, I, other than that, what is the issue with the cosine function? If I have an angle and I plot the cosine of an angle, how does it look like? It's, uh, it's what? At zero, it's a one. And then at pi, is what? Minus one? Right? And it goes down like this, right? So that's a monotonic function between 0 and pi. That's usually what we say. That means we can invert it between 0 and pi, which means my arc cosine is not going to give me any, anything outside 0 and pi. Right? Big deal. I can always fix that. So what you say is, is, is this. You add this condition if the radial velocity is negative, then what you have computed there becomes uh, 2 pi minus theta. You fix it that way. What, what does VR negative mean? When is VR negative? And of course, this is assuming that I am on a closed orbit circle. Uh, right. Well. You start, say that you, you imagine you start here on uh, perigee, it doesn't need to be the case, but what is VR as I go away from perigee and I go to apogee? Positive, Positive right? Because it's a radial direction, I'm going away, my radius is increasing, and here it becomes negative. So I'm basically covering this other part, I'm saying that since the arc cosine is going, when I am down here, it's actually going to give me this, this angle here, but I want <coughs> this one, that's my fix. So. After apogee, I fix it that way. What if it's circular? VR is always zero, right? What do you do in that case? It's not, it's really no, no big tricks. It's just if you want this thing to be zero and two, between zero and two pi, always positive, which is what people use. It's, you always do this first, you do this computation, but again, this is going to give you 0 to pi. Well, the other check in that case that you can do is, for example, if, uh, uh, what do you want to do? What if it's a circle? Where is the eccentricity vector? See, these orbital parameters have special cases that you need to keep in mind. There is no eccentricity vector. So basically you can say that the eccentricity vector or, or the axis from which you start measuring things is whatever is your position at initial time. It's the r that I give you. It's the r at time zero. Say that it's this one. It doesn't matter. That's, that's where I start counting my, uh, so r zero. That's where I start counting my uh, true anomaly, right? 
there's no other choice, there's no E vector, it doesn't exist, it's zero. Okay, so uh, in that case, what do you do? Well, you can compare you know, R and R0 and get where you are, right? Look at the quadrants here, compare R and R0 and see uh, how they relate to each other and fix that theta. Um, probably going to give you an uncollected homework where you have to program all this stuff with special cases so that you can debug all the special cases. Any questions? No? So everything, everything that I'm going to do is arc cosines. Really, there's no, no, uh, no other uh, calculation required. Um, yeah, I think I can erase this. So that's theta. By the way, what is the range for these orbital parameters? Where theta, we knew it already. It's the true anomaly. We said it's, you know, we like it to be between 0 and, and uh, 2 pi. The big omega, the ren, is also usually assumed to be between 0 and 2 pi. And uh, same for... Uh, little omega, the inclination is 0 to pi. If you have a zero inclination orbit, what does that mean? Orbital plane. If you have a 180 inclination orbit, what does that mean? Orbital plane. Maybe the difference is that it's going one way or the other, but um, so, so if you have zero inclination, h is aligned with z, right? So it means that the plane of the orbit is on the orbital plane. And so 0 and, and pi, basically, they are the same thing. What can change is the direction in which you're moving on that line. But that is something that you need to define being in the plane. The inclination is not going to help you. H is going to help you, but yes? But you're saying the orbital plane will be on the orbital plane, or the equatorial? The equatorial. Say that again? Sorry. Oh, that no, this, this red line is going to be in the xy plane. Okay. The trajectory is going to be in the xy plane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is the equatorial, to be completely thorough, uh, I think it's better to call that the celestial equatorial plane because it's not the equator of the planet. Again, it does, it's not a disk that rotates with the planet. It's, it contains the equator of the planet, but it's fixed. Yes? If um, our inclination is zero, then how do we measure omega and little omega right. if we don't have uh, you don't. descending nodes? Right, you don't. You have to make a choice. You don't have the ascending or descending node. They don't exist. And so what you do is you may still have an eccentric orbit, meaning you, stay, you st still have an E vector. Well, what you can do is measure the little omega from the x-axis, from the vernal equinox. That's, you need to decide what to do in that case. In fact, again, I'm surprised you haven't heard about all the angles, but the, the sequences of all the angles that are symmetric, meaning the first and last number are the same, this or this other type of rotation, etc., etc., and this is the one we're doing now. All those types of uh, sequences, they have a singularity when the second rotation is zero or pi. And singularity means what exactly you just mentioned that what do I do with the other two angles? Because one of the two disappears actually if you are in the plane. You know, the big omega and little omega, they basically are both measured about the z-axis, right? And why is that a singularity? Because you may locate the direction of E by choosing infinite combinations of little omega and big omega. So in other words, uh, if, I am, if this is my z-axis pointing at me, right? And this is my x-axis, and I have a, a, an orbit that has zero inclination, and the eccentricity vector is here, I could, I, could, I could make up a line of node that doesn't exist, that it's here, and call this big omega and little omega, this angle here, and say that if this is 40 degrees, for example, the total is 40 degrees, I can choose 20 and 20, and I'm fine. But I can also choose 30 and 10, and so on and so forth. You can go, you can go on forever, which is absolutely a bad idea, because as you don't want the position of a point in space to be represented by more than three numbers at any given time, x, y, z, you can't have the orientation of an object represented by more than three values for angles. It becomes ambiguous, right? It becomes a terrible way of representing the orientation in space. Does it make sense? If, if this is my point in this room, x, y, z is, are one, two, three, they need to be one, two, three. You cannot tell me they are one, two, three, and also five, six, seven. It doesn't make any sense. 
it needs to be a unique way to represent the position of the point. The same goes for roller angles. The moment your three numbers are not unique to represent how the frame is oriented, then is not, that sequence is not good anymore. So each order angle sequence has this issue. That you hit the second angle that can give you a problem. And so in our case, what people do is that they make a choice. They say, okay, this is zero, once and for all. And you just think about little omega. That's, that's what you can do. So you force one of the two to be zero. Yeah, they, they have limitations. All angles are not the perfect answer to represent orientations, but they're very useful. They're visual. Uh, okay, we go back to the other ones now. Let's see. How do you do the inclination? Same. What are the vectors that you should involve with the inclination? Am I losing everybody on this? H and Z. Yeah. Probably. H and Z, right? Okay. So what is H dotted with Z, let's call this Z unit vector. It's basically H A, H Z, right? This is the norm of H times one. So nothing, because this is norm one. Cosine of the inclination. So my inclination is the arc cosine of uh, h dotted with z over the norm of h. And of course you can call this here, you can just call it the projection of h on z if you want hz, but that's what it is. And this is okay between 0 and pi, so I don't need to do any fix. That's how you compute your inclination, period. Done. Now, along the same lines, what are the vectors, vectors involved between, uh, for, for, for big h, the ren? It's x and n. I don't have n. What is n? Yeah, it's the line of node. How you, so remember what you st you're starting from r and v. And we said, okay, that is equivalent to saying that I have e and h. And of course, you have the directions of x, y, and z. So with those uh, tools that you can use, you need to tell me what n is before I can do this arc cosine. There's a lot of cross products in classes that have dynamics somewhere in the title. Is n h cross z? Is it h cross z or z cross h? h, cross h. So yes, uh, if we want to compute the unit vector along n, that's what I would do. I would say uh, z cross h. Of course, I think we should normalize that, right? Make sense? And then, same, same idea. Um, and now this is, if I do it this way with a unit vector, uh, it should be pretty simple. What, well, let's, let's do it. N dotted with x is directly what? Is the cosine of omega, right? Because they are both unit vectors. Agree? Disagree? And so, okay, so this is my second angle that I computed, that's theta. Uh, this is going to give me big omega, which is an arc cosine of n dotted with x. You can call this nx. It's the component along the x direction of the, li the line the line of nodes, not the node line. Not listening. So now this needs a fix though. I want it 0 to pi. Uh, so what is the case? So if I am with a line, line of nodes that starts at x and goes all the way around to minus x, I'm fine. That's the arc cosine is going to give me that angle 0 to pi. If I pass that point, what happens? Well, the component of n along the y direction becomes negative. So that is what triggered my corrections, right? So my correction is if n dotted with the y direction is negative, then basically do the same that I did there. You, you say that omega becomes 2 pi minus omega. It's just so that you get a 0 to 360 or 0 to 2 pi angle, yes? Oh. Why? 
Yeah, why? Right. Imagine that you're looking at the xy plane from above, x-axis and n direction. If you start with n along uh, x, big omega is zero. You go around pi. That's okay. The arc cosine is going to give you zero to pi. After that, it becomes um, the component on the y-axis becomes negative, and that allows you to do the fix. Uh, I need uh, just one last one, and then I'll leave you. Well, there's 10 minutes. I want to make a comment. Can I raise this? And then you can take your tests. The last one is omega. So what are the vectors involved? E and n, right? So E dotted with n, we said that we computed that as a unit vector, is basically the norm of E, norm of n is 1, cosine of little omega, so again, it's an arc cosine. And uh, there is a correction here as well. What is the correction? If I want little omega between 0 and 2 pi, so imagine the E vector that can assume different configurations starting from being on the line of nodes, going all the way opposite to the line of nodes, and that's 0 to pi, and then you go past that, what happens in that case? Something becomes negative. It's the component of E on Z, right? And that's how you go from state vector to orbital parameters. The, uh, the way that goes, the process to go the other way, it will involve dealing with this sequence of other angles a little more in details. So I'll, I'll deal with the rotation matrices, and we're going to be formal about other angles. It's, it's a lot more entertaining. Do you have any questions? We still have a few minutes before he starts giving you the tests. No? I know you want your tests. I only have one comment about the exam and the homework. The average for the homework was 91 over 100. The average for the test was 74 over 100, with more than 60% of the class above a B. So that doesn't justify any curving. And by the way, I don't curve. You have 25% bonus points all over the place with the survey, the survey, the SDK. So we don't do that. And especially this result doesn't justify it because most of the people got it right, and then there is a little tray of people who usually have not turned in the homework one, who are not doing that great on the test. And that was the idea, that you turn in the homework one and you do it by yourself, and then you come to the test. For those people, I only have one suggestion. If you now start fresh, and you really start studying, you can still get an A. You don't have a good, if you, if you remove completely homework one and test one, it's 25%. That 25% comes from the survey, and if you, if you do the SDK, both levels. So this is a wake-up call for those who haven't paid enough attention. If you start doing it now, you can still get a pretty good grade. If you don't do it now, then it's going to go downhill. Um, I never said that this is an easy class. I said that I'm in favor of students and giving chances to get credit, but if people don't do their part working, there is no credit uh, that I can come up with, because this is, this is what we do. So uh, if you have any questions, a week with the TAs, then it's me, and uh, I'll see you on Monday. Yes, Monday. Thank you.